Okay, welcome to our introduction on GarageBand. We're using the latest version of GarageBand, GarageBand 10. Uh, I'd like you to start by creating a new project, File New. It's going to present you with uh, this dialog box, which probably looks like this on your screen at the moment. And what we want to do is set up our project correctly. So before you go into the project, I want you to click on Details. And the details, we have a couple of parameters, Tempo, Key Signature, Time Signature. Tempo relates to how quickly you're going to play the piece of music, and this can be changed at any stage. Uh, 120 is, is the default tempo. This stands for 120 beats per minute, or BPM. And what that means is if you were to count the number of beats in a piece of music while on a stop clock, stopwatch and stop it after 60 seconds, the number of beats that you've counted up to would be 120. The next two are a little bit more important. The key signature here is specifying C and major. And we did a whole class on major and minor uh, key signatures and chords, so we know what they're about. Uh, we can also see that we can specify a different letter or with an accidental or not. And uh, it's important that you set this correctly before entering any music into the software. If you change it afterwards, it will change it for you, but it'll also change absolutely everything that you've just done. So uh, you will be very surprised with the uh, results that you will get. So as a rule, we do not change the key signature once we start entering music into GarageBand, or any other software for that matter. Uh, time signature comes next, and we've seen 2 4, 3 4, and 4 4. This means four crotchet beats in a bar. That's going to become important uh, in when we look at how we're going to edit notes in this sequencing software. Okay, uh, we also have audio input and audio output, and this is part of setting up your sound, and we've uh, done that in the past, so we can leave that for now. So I'm going to close off the details. I'm going to double click on the empty project to open the project. And this is what we're presented with. So it's a good idea for you to get your head around this. Um, you might want to draw this out on a piece of paper. Uh, we have the menu at the top. Underneath we have the toolbar in this rectangle here. And we'll go through what all of the different buttons mean in, in a few minutes. Underneath that we have different sections within the main area. So we have a library panel. And this includes all the patches for different categories of instruments. Next to that we have the tracks and the timeline. So this grey box here is referred to as a track header and this includes the picture for a particular track of the, uh, the icon of what the instrument is, the name of the instrument patch and also we have a mute, a solo, a volume and a pan. So a mute is for turning off the sound on that particular track Solo is so that you only hear the sound on that track, in other words, muting all the other tracks. The volume allows you to adjust the level that the instrument is playing back at, make it louder or quieter. And the LR pan uh, means you can pan the instrument so that it only comes out of the left speaker, only comes out of the right speaker, or a, very, a mixture of both, and you can govern uh, how much of each that is. Uh, then we have the timeline, and this timeline is showing a ruler here, which counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And we're going to explore that in a bit more detail in a second. Um, and onto this timeline, we record in some notes. So there's a big red button for record, and we're going to uh, record straight away uh, some music. Now, as I don't have a physical keyboard when I'm making this video, I'm just going to turn on the uh, musical uh, typing so you can actually see what I'm doing as well. And I'm going to record myself pressing the keys. Okay, so. <laughs> So what I've just done is I've recorded in some music into GarageBand, close off my keyboard, and now we can see that those notes are stored in this box. This box is called a region, and GarageBand uses this terminology. Other software calls call, might call this a clip or a box or a block, uh, but GarageBand it's called a region, so it's important that we learn the terminology. If I double click on this, it brings up the track editor. And in here we can see exactly what we've done and we can make some changes. And we'll come back to that in a second. You double click it again, it gets rid of it. Another way of it achieving the same uh, result is to click on this button here, the one that looks like a scissors. This is the editor's button. If I click on it, it brings up the track editor. And again, if I click it again, it gets rid of it. Okay, so um, maybe we'll go through some of the buttons here. Um, if we start with the first button, which is the library button, that will open and close that library panel. 
Usually we want to have it closed off so that the screen appears to be more simplified. Next to that we have the quick help. If I click on the quick help button, you see I get a pop-up telling me what the button that the mouse pointer is over does. So if I move to the next button, it tells us that this is the smart controls button, opens the smart controls area where you can quickly modify the sound of the current patch. And a quick way of doing this is to use the command uh, slash buttons uh, held down together in order to bring it up, bring up the smart controls. Okay, so here's the smart controls for the classic electric piano. And by adjusting each one of these smart controls, I can fine tune the instrument sound. So if I play back the uh, recording, and now I'm going to change a parameter, for example, I'm going to turn the reverb way up. Let's hear the difference to the sound. So each note tends to linger a lot longer, and that's the reverb after being added to the sound. I'm just going to turn that back down. Um, now we could modify each of these and create a different effect to the sound, and what we're actually doing here is changing the timbre of the sound. We mentioned three characteristics, amplitude, frequency, and timbre in an earlier class, and what we're doing here is modifying the timbre or timbre of the sound. If, depending on the instrument you choose, you'll see a different picture to represent the different parameters and the number of parameters may change as well. I might just give that a, a little go. Let's bring up our library, change the instrument to maybe a piano. Let's have a look at the Steinway Grand Piano. And you can see I've got a, a different set of controls. If I was to go to guitar and choose a different guitar, you can see again we've got different types of controls, different names, and they look the image is, is different. And this is how uh, virtual instruments are normally presented in software. Uh, they all have their own individual look. Okay, I'm going to go back to the vintage electric piano, classic electric piano. There we go. I'm going to turn off my smart controls. I'm going to turn off the library. And we've now seen the first four buttons on the toolbar. The next five buttons are referred to as the transport controls. We have rewind, fast forward, Back to the start, which is sometimes displayed as a stop button. We have a play button and we have a record button. And you've seen me use the record. Uh, a note about the record, when you are recording, uh, there's a couple of buttons on the far side that affect it. So if we take a look at these, these ones over here, uh, we have one, two, three, four, that is the count in. And normally when a band is playing, somebody has to keep time, that person will go a one, two, three, four, and then everybody starts at the correct time. Otherwise you play the right notes, but in, uh, if everybody's playing at a different starting point, they don't come together to harmonize and make the music that you're trying to make. So it's important that we stay in time, and, and the counting will help you do that. Um, the metronome has a number of different states. So it has uh, this state, which has got a purple metronome. And what this means is you will hear the one, two, three, four as a tick, tock, tock, tock. Um, but the metronome stops after the counting. So we don't hear a metronome. If you want to hear the metronome all the time, click on the metronome again, it turns the whole thing purple, and this means that once you start recording, it will um, you get your count in, and then it will continue to play the metronome. Like that. Okay, so I'm now going to turn the metronome off, and I'm going to turn the count in off. And we've now learned what those two buttons are. There's two buttons to the left. Um, the first one here is the tuner button. This is useful if you are recording into GarageBand using your electric guitar or acoustic guitar. You may need to tune the strings before you start playing and this uh, button will facilitate uh, the software in helping you to tune your guitar properly. As we're not using guitars we won't be using that button for the rest of the semester. Okay, next to that we have the uh, cycle button, and this is useful. Uh, if we turn it on, you see it gives a yellow region, this uh, cycle region, and we can adjust the length of this, and we can also adjust the position of it. And the purpose of it is to make what's under the yellow bar play on a continuous loop. So if I rewind, play. <laughs> Thank you. 
So it keeps going around and around in a loop, and that's the purpose of the cycle region. This is useful for maybe when you're mixing later, and we'll see that at the end of the class. Uh, it's also useful if you are practicing the keyboard and you've got a particularly tricky part that you want to practice over and over again. Uh, and it's also very useful when we're recording drums and we want to layer one drum on top of another, and we look at that in a later session. Okay, um, next to those buttons we have the master volume, the volume of the output of the software. And for the purposes of my recording, I'm just going to turn this down a little bit so that it doesn't get too loud later. And this, of course, is affecting the first act, uh, characteristic of sound that we mentioned, which was amplitude, measured in decibels. OK, we have a couple of buttons to the right. First one here is the text button. Uh, which gives you uh, a notepad into which you can record textual uh, messages. Um, and this might be useful for making some notes that you store with your music. Okay, this is new to this version of GarageBand. And we'll use that in a, in a little bit, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, if we look at the one to the right, this is the media browser. And this allows you to import uh, sounds, images, and music from your library. So we have audio, movies, and we can select from different photographs and import them into our um, GarageBand project. And for the purposes of this subject, I won't be covering that. The button in the middle is uh, very interesting because this is the loops section, and this is where the real joy in using GarageBand comes. And I'm going to come back to that later in the session. For now, we've got a region which has some notes in it. We recorded a scale in it, and it's not quite right. So what we want to do now is to fix this. So let's take a look at what we can do. If I double click on a region, it brings up an editor. Here's my editor. And what we can see is how I recorded in my notes. And I can adjust my notes by dragging to right or dragging them to the left. And this is changing the position at which they play, position in time. So we see I've got the first note, which is the first beat in the bar. The third note is the third note in the bar. And in between the two of those, I need to have a note which plays exactly in between them. And if I was to correct my timing here, I'm a little bit late. So I'm going to take this note and move it to the left. And what's happening here is I am snapping the notes into position and what we're getting is the notes playing correctly. Now the first note wasn't actually sounding and that's because it came a little bit too early. So if I move that to the right, then move it back to the left, it's going to snap into position at exactly the right time. And now I'm going to hear that note play every time I press play. So this is sounding a lot better now because it's playing each note at the right time but it doesn't hold each note for the correct amount of time. So we can adjust how long a note is held by just stretching out each one of these note regions. You notice as the mouse pointer gets close to the end, I can drag it out. Okay, so now we've got a better sounding scale. But it's starting to sound a bit machine-like, and that's because everything is too perfect. And I'm not suggesting that perfect is the way we should perform our music. Um, a lot of software has built, have built-in features for humanizing and making it sound more natural. This is sounding a little bit machine-like. But for the purposes of what we're trying to do, it's teaching us how to edit the notes, and that's fine. Uh, there's another uh, option that we might want to look at, and that is if we take an individual note, when we click on it, it gets highlighted. And what we can see to the left is a velocity slider, and this is telling us how quickly we struck the note, how hard we struck the note. So I've got a number here of 98. On this one, it's 98. Now, if you're playing on your physical keyboard, you might find that each one of these has a different value, and you can change their values at any time. So as practice, I'm going to change each one of these to, a, to be a number in the middle 60s. Won't get too hung up about exactly which value they are, but somewhere in the 60s. 
And this is the middle value between 0 and 127. Now, because I've turned all the notes down, they should sound a little bit quieter. And that does sound quite a bit different to how we had it a moment ago. And that's because we're striking the notes uh, easier this time, and that affects the sound of the instrument. Okay. All right, so we've changed the velocity, we've changed the starting time, and we've changed the duration of the notes. And what that allows us to see is uh, the score. And again, we've looked at music notation. This is one way of notating. It's called the piano roll. But if we click on the score tab, we can actually see how it's produced this music. Now, on my machine at the moment, it's showing me this is the bass, and it's showing that it's playing um, uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. I'm going to change that to treble clef. And now we can see that basically what's happened is I've recorded the notes in, but I've recorded them below middle C, which is why it's showing up as complicated as it is. So there's a way of fixing this. Let's go to the piano roll. And you can see that it's playing the right notes, but it started at C2. So what I'm going to do now is edit this so that I can see the notes starting at um, C3 instead of C2. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a marquee, and a marquee is where you just draw a rectangle around what you want to select, and everything inside the rectangle gets selected. Now that I've selected all the notes, I'm going to take the bottom note, C2, and I'm going to drag that up to C3. Just straight up. And you'll notice in the pop-up it's telling me that the pitch of the note that I'm about to uh, release was C3 and also that what I've done is moved my notes up by plus 12. And that plus 12 is the number of semitones between a C and the C above it, or the number of semitones in an octave. If I now look at the score, you can see I've got a much nicer score this time. And if I just switch it to treble clef, We've simplified it and got exactly what we want. This is a scale of C major on the right hand with treble clef. And what's really good now is that I can take that score and I can print that out as proper sheet music. Let's take a look at how to do that. File, print, set up the page. It's usually right, so we can click OK. And now instead of going to a physical printer, we're going to use the PDF printer. And I'm going to say open PDF and preview. And what this does is it gives me the sheet music that I've just produced. It tells me it's in 4-4 time, we're on the treble clef. This is the sheet music for the electric piano. This sheet music is called Untitled. It's at a tempo of 120 and it's uh, authored by Colin Dunphy. So how do we change the title here? Well, you can't go in and edit the PDF. There's a better way of doing it. So I'm going to close this off. And what we're going to do is save our project. So save our GarageBand project, file save, and give it a name. How you type the name is how that's going to appear on the printout. So I'm going to call this scale. Save, replace, because I've already got one. And now if I go file print, repeat the process again. It doesn't ask me for the page setup this time. I can go straight to the PDF. And now I can see scale uh, as the title. Now, if you're using your software, you might find that your name is not included, um, particularly if you're in the student labs. So let's uh, look at how you fix that. You go into GarageBand, go to the Preferences. Inside the Preferences, we can specify the composer name. So you have the General tab, the Audio tab, Loops, My Information and Advanced. And to change the composer, you need to go to My Info and change the composer name. Then when you uh, repeat the exercise, file print and open the PDF in the preview, you'll see your name included on the sheet. And this is important uh, because you may want to use this for copyright reasons. Um, copyright exists when you create a new creation, but in Europe, uh, sorry, automatically when you create a new uh, creation, but in Europe you might need to prove that um, in a court of law later. So you need to prove when did you create it. And a useful way of doing it is to print out your music just the way we've done, uh, make a hard copy, send it to yourself as registered post, 
and do not open it. And then if you need to go to court to prove your copyright, um, you'll, you'll be able to um, have what you need. Okay, let's take a look at the control bar, which is this LCD panel in the middle. Um, it's got different sections in it. Uh, let's take a look at the first section, which is the Beats and Project. If you click, you can select Beats and Project or Time. And you notice that the display changes according to which one you choose. Now, for music skills, we're always going to be working in Beats and Project, but uh, for now, we're just going to show you both. Okay, so Beats and Project, what this means is that the, the next uh, list of numbers are all related to uh, beats. So this says bar, this is the beat, this is the division, and this is the tick. And these four numbers come together to make up what's known as a measure. Let's take a look at an explanation of measure. So I've just created a little slide here to help. And um, what we can see is the first beat in your piece of music is measure one, the second is one, two, the third, one, three, the fourth, one, four. Um, then we get to the fifth one, which which is two. Then instead of 2.1, it's 2.2, two, 2.3, two, two, 2.4. Two, then we'll go to the ninth beat, which would be three. The tenth would be 3.2. So this is the simple version where we've got the bar. And then if we want to indicate a beat other than one, we use a dot followed by the beat number. But in the software, what you'll see is the full measure. So the first beat is 1.1.1.1, the second is 1.2.1.1, and so on. So if we look down here, what we're seeing is 2.3.1.1, and what that is is the seventh beat in the bar. Now this is important when it comes to understanding what the software is displaying. If we look at the software here, we can see we've got bar 1, bar 2, bar 3, bar 4. If you look underneath it, you can see the subdivisions. And these subdivisions are the 4 is 4, 1. This next one is 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4. This also is useful when we look at the piano roll. So inside the piano roll, we're seeing 1, 1, 3, and 2. Let's make that easier to follow. If we adjust the horizontal zoom slider by zooming in, we see one, two, three, and four. So these are the bar numbers. If I look at it in more detail by zooming out, we can now see a one, a one, two, a one, three, a one, four, two, 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 three, Two four, three three two three 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 four 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 two four three four four, and this corresponds to what I've just shown you on the slide here. We have the first beat, which is one. The fifth beat, which is two. The ninth beat, which is three. And in between them, there's one two one three one four, two 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 three two four. So it's important that you get your head around measures because this is where we identify where we want to put notes. Okay, let's take a look at the other option. Uh, we've had beats and project. Let's take a look at time. So if we go into our time, we can see that it just changes the view to this series of numbers. And this is the SMPTE uh, time code number, or the SMPTE reference. And it tells us where the current playhead is. So if we look at my screen, it's this thing here is the playhead. We're also seeing it up here. Let's close off the editor, so we're just looking at the 1. And we can see this is between 10 and 15. As I move the playhead, we can see, there we go, 13 seconds. Okay, so SIMTI is short for the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. And the code tells us exactly where something is in time. And this is useful for trying to synchronize um, video and audio, and maybe pyrotechnics so that we can create multimedia. In GarageBand, we see it as the hours, the minutes, the seconds, and the frames. And you can have uh, a fraction of a frame as well.
So we'll be using Simpty next year for digital audio production, but for now, let's leave our projects set at uh, Beats. Okay, so let's take another way, look at another way of entering some notes. So again, we're going to go and Command, hold the Command key and click. This is going to create an empty region. We can resize the region by moving the mouse pointer to the right and it will change into one of two different mouse pointers. So the one that you're seeing at the moment is called a loop. And if we move it downwards, we'll see that it changes into a resize. So what we want to do is resize. So I'm going to resize this out to um, two bars. And you can see that in the pop-up, the tooltip is giving us length is 2000. And what this means is it's a length of two bars, which we can see it starts at four and finishes at six. So that's a length of two bars. I'm going to use this to enter in the notes for the descending part of the scale. And we're going to do this manually by entering um, the notes. So we started on C3 and we finished on C4. So what we're going to do this time round is I'm going to draw in the notes manually instead of playing them. So we can do this by in the same way that we created a region on the track, we can create a note region the same way. Hold the command key, click, and this creates a note. So in this case it's creating a note that goes from 4 to 4-2, which is a one full beat. And that's fine. So we've got C, let's create the next note, which is our B, we've got an A, G, F, scroll across, E, D, and C. So I'm now just drawing in my notes manually. Okay, so let's have a listen to that. I'm going to put both of these regions together. Let's see what it sounds like. So although they look completely different on the screen, they actually are just different views of the same information and it's storing the up and the down or the ascending descending parts of the scale. I want to see the whole thing together. Again I can adjust the zoom slider and now I can see those notes and that's all nice and good. Okay so we've seen all the toolbar buttons. You know how they all work. Um, and what we're going to do next is we're going to add some new tracks. So if you're making a piece of music, you're going to be using multiple instruments. You create a new track by clicking on the plus button, the new tracks button. And by doing that, we double click, software instrument, and then we choose the instrument that we want to use. So this time around, I'm going to use a piano. I've got a Steinway Grand Piano, so that's my patch. Once I've selected that, I can close off the library. So now I've got a classic electric piano, and now I've got a Steinway Grand Piano. And what we're going to do is, while we're playing the scale, I'm going to play a chord. And I'm going to play the chord at, uh, once in each bar. So I'm going to play it, hold it for a bar, and then play it again, hold it for a bar, play it again, hold it for a bar, play it again, hold it for a bar. I'm going to look at some ways of doing that. So, uh, as we saw before, we can enter the notes or we can record them in. Uh, as I don't have a keyboard, I can't record them in, so for this video, I'm just going to draw them in. So I'm creating an empty region by command clicking, double click to bring up the editor, and I want the notes in the chord of C major. So let's uh, zoom in and make this a bit easier. So I want um, to play the chord of C major, which is command click for the C. I also want an E, and I want a G. And I'm playing all three at the same time because that's what a chord is. You play more than one note at the same time. Now these notes are going to last for one beat, but I want them to last for a whole bar. So I'm going to resize them by drawing a marquee to select them all. Then I'm going to resize them to make them last all the way for one bar. So they go from one, one, two, one, three, one, four, finishing at the end of the bar before the two. So this is a chord of C major. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to repeat that. So we showed you how to resize a region. Let's look at looping a region move a mouse pointer to the top right what we see is this new mouse pointer and if we drag what this allows us to do is to repeat what we're playing in the first bar in bars two three and four and you'll notice that the first bar is highlighted but bars two three and four are grayed out and that's because they're only going to play whatever's in the first bar it's not a copy it's a loop 
you can see the indication of a loop by these little indents and these are saying this is the end of the loop and then it starts again and then it ends and then it starts ends starts again so if we listen to this back so now we've played our chord and we play it on each bar the chord is a bit loud um, and we'll come back to that in just a second but what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make my uh, track editor a little bit smaller by resizing and I'm going to add another track software instrument and this time I'm going to go for some bass uh, I've only got two uh, different basses so I'm going to select the first one and again we can not only uh, uh, copy and loop but we can also copy up and down across tracks so to copy or duplicate if you hold the alt key while dragging a region it's going to make a duplicate. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to play the scale on the first track. I've got a grand piano playing the chord, and then I've got a copy of the chord uh, to be played on the bass. So let's just have a listen. Okay, so to me the bass is a little bit muddy, so I want to clean up the bass a bit. So let's take a look at the bass. So I'm going to get rid of the tracks window just to make life simple. I'm going to take a look at the playhead, bring it back to bring my playhead back to the start and with the finger style bass selected I can see what I'm playing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove those top two notes by highlighting them and then pressing the backspace key. That's how you delete in GarageBand. Highlight what you want to delete and then press the delete key or the backspace key. So what I've done here is I've just got the C playing, uh, but I'm actually going to play this a bit shorter. I'm going to have this repeat and it's going to it's going to play maybe um, it'll, we'll hold it for a, a count of two and then we'll uh, leave it off and then we'll play for a count of two and so on. So let's have a listen to that. So the bass could be bassier, and the reason that it's not sounding so bassy is because I'm playing it in the middle of the keyboard. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make this sound deeper, make it more bassy. There's two ways of doing this. I could select the note, and I could drag it down. So instead of playing C3, I'm playing C2. I could even go down to C1. And that'll give us some nice sub bass. Let's have a listen. And that's fine. Another way of achieving the same thing, so I'm just going to undo and undo. We could achieve the same thing by transposing this note. So if we select the region, you'll notice that instead of velocity, we now see transpose. And the transpose is specified in semitones. There are 12 semitones in an octave, and you can figure that out by looking at a keyboard, putting your finger on C1, counting all of the number of steps of the adjacent keys until you reach the same note an octave higher. So it's usually 12. It's always 12. Okay, so if we want to make something deeper or sound lower, we use minus 12. Okay, so this will play my C3 minus 12 semitones lower, which would be the equivalent of C2. And I can go down to minus 24, which would mean that my C3 would be played 24 semitones lower, which would make it C1. So there's two ways of doing it. So we still have that nice sub bass. Okay, nice job. So let's look at another trick. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that C and I'm going to make a copy of it. And I'm going to make a copy by all dragging. And I'm going to move it so that it's going to play the first C and then it's going to play the second C. So we're going up and down. So let's have a listen to that when it's on loop.
So what we've now done is managed to create three different instrument parts. They're all playing different things and they all sound harmonious. They all sound nice. Okay, so the next thing we would do is, uh, if we were producing a song, is we would have to mix it. And this means get the relative levels of the individual instruments correct. And we can do that by uh, taking a look at the, the track header. So for example, if I just wanted to listen to the bass on its own, um, I might solo it. So we only hear that track. Let's turn off the solo. If I mute the sound, I would be listening to everything except the bass. But actually what I want to do this time is listen to all three, but I want to listen to it over and over again, so I'm going to turn on the cycle region. And I'm going to make this last for the entire piece. So I'm going to change the length of this, the, the region so that it gets to the end, it goes back to the start. And while it's doing that, I'm going to be adjusting the volume levels. So to start with, I'm going to turn them all down to minus infinity. Except for one instrument. So we're going to make the scale um, not start at, at maximum. Maximum, by the way, is zero, zero dB. But I'm going to bring it back to about minus three decibels. And that gives us enough headroom to be able to add other stuff in later. So I'll set that to minus three. And then we're going to start introducing the other instruments. Can't hear them at the moment, but we introduce them using our slider. And when it's loud enough, you stop. So I'm happy with that level. So what we've got is the electric piano playing at minus three, and the chord is playing at minus four. Now let's bring in the bass. So if I brought it in too much, that would sound, it would be drowning out everything. So what I'm gonna do is bring it back out and introduce it until it just sounds nice. And I'm happy with that. So what we've got now are three different levels for the instruments. And these numbers will depend on how hard you've struck the note, how loud the instrument is and so on. So it, it's not that you learn off the numbers, you have to listen and be able to apply them. A word of warning, depending on the headphones you're using, you're going to get completely different results here. So if you're using um, DJ headphones uh, or domestic headphones, they usually enhance the bass. So what this means is that when you're listening back to the track, you're not hearing what's actually on your computer, you're hearing what's on your computer when it's been enhanced with bass. So as a result, if you're listening, what you're going to be inclined to do is to not make the bass loud enough. So when somebody then listens back with an ordinary pair of headphones, it's going to sound very, very light on the bass. Likewise, if you're using uh, very toppy headphones, uh, any headphones that are used for voice, they're going to emphasize the mid and high frequencies. So they're going to sound louder in your, in your ears, but when somebody else then listens back, it's going to sound like those frequencies are missing from your recording. So this is why I suggested at the start of the semester that if you're buying headphones, I give you a list of three budget pairs of studio reference monitors. And the idea there is that those reference monitors keep all the frequencies equal so that you, you hear um, uh, you're working off a baseline that, that sounds right. OK, so now that we've got our song mixed, we're now going to share it with the world. So it's great we've created our track, it's got three different instruments, they're all playing different parts, we've also created the sheet music, but we want to be able to use this song on our website. So how do we get it out of GarageBand and make it into a format that we can store on our phone or iPod, on the web, uh, or whatever? Well we can do that by using the share. So if we click on the share menu you can see you can share your song to iTunes, you can just share a ringtone to iTunes, um, uh, share your song to the media browser, share your song to SoundCloud. SoundCloud is a service that you should take a look at, sign up to. Uh, you will be adding your uh, compositions to SoundCloud as part of this course. Uh, we can also airdrop to another uh, Mac computer. You can email it. Uh, or you can burn your song to disk if you've got a, a CD writer on your computer. Or you can export your song to disk. So the most common option here that we'll be using most of the time is directly exporting your song to disk. So go ahead and select that. 
And here we specify the name of the song and we have three options. We have an AAC file which is, uh, allows us to save it in the format that's used by iTunes and we have different quality settings. We also have MP3 which is the predominant format on the internet for since the millennium. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is being overtaken by MPEG-4 or AAC files. And then we have uncompressed, so if you want top quality, no compression, no loss of data, then we'll use AIFF. We'll be exploring these formats in detail in digital audio production next semester. Uh, so for now maybe let's uh, create an MP3 file and we can choose different quality settings. Uh, no reason why we shouldn't choose the highest quality, so let's do that. And we export and this now creates um, an audio file on your computer in the location that you specified. Okay, it's time to show you some of the magic in GarageBand. So let's create a new project. Uh, yes, I'm going to save. And we're going to create a new empty project again. Here's my new empty project. I don't need the library. And what we're going to be using this time is the loops. So this is pretty much making music using Lego bricks. What we've got is a library of sounds, loops, and my library there's 1700 odd items. In your library in the classroom uh, I understand there's 13 and a half thousand loops. The reason for the difference in the numbers is because in the classroom we're also sharing a library with um, Logic Professional which is the a professional version of GarageBand if you like. It's, it's the tool that you will move on to after outgrowing GarageBand. Um, it comes with a, an extensive library and GarageBand can use that library and it is in the classroom. So this gives you access to a whole host of samples and more than enough to cater for pretty much any um, type of sound that you want to create for your games, for your multimedia creations, backing tracks, podcasts or whatever. I'm going to show you just how easy it is to make a backing track or even a professional track using the loop library. So what we've got in the loops panel by clicking on this button here is a filter and this tells us or enables us to reduce the, the list of items that meet the criteria. So it's like a search, refinement of search. So I'm looking for drums. So I'm going to select all drums. I only want beats. Uh, I want, uh, for example, electric. Let's turn that off. Let's go with electronic. So I'm now down to 330 items. I can scroll through the list and we can even sort the list by different headings. So I can sort by color. Uh, let's have a listen to this. That's more my style, so I'm going to drag that clip over onto where it says drag Apple Loops here. Okay, and when you drag it over, what it does is it creates a new track with a different icon, and you notice that it's in this case it's a blue loop, and this means it's a sample or recording. So I can drag that and I can put it wherever I want on the track. Let's drag it back to the start. I'm just scrolling horizontally there. So there we go, I've got a beat. Now we've already seen that we can loop, so I can move my mouse pointer to the top right hand corner, maybe make uh, one, two, three, four versions of this. So I've got the first uh, two bars, then it repeats for two, repeats for two, repeats for two. Maybe I'll just drop it off at the end, just make it a little bit short. So what we've got now is, is um, a beat, and um, let's put some bass with that. So I'm going to reset, I'm going to turn on bass, I'm going to find some nice um, uh, bass sounds to go with this. So somebody's already played all the samples for you. That sounds nice. I'm going to take that one. And let's uh, add something else. Let's add another part. Maybe uh, some um, electric piano, for example. That'll do nicely. Let's put that in there. Um, maybe rearrange them this way. We'll have the piano come in first. It's going to repeat on a loop. And we have our bass repeating. 
and this will just give you a demo of how quickly you can put together a piece of music. So let's have a listen back. And you get the idea. So it's literally building music like Lego blocks. Uh, just to highlight one other thing, we have blue loops, which are sample recordings, but we also have uh, green loops, and these are MIDI. So let's um, find something else to go with this. Let's find some more MIDI. And uh, Let's try that. So I'm going to drag that over and we're going to continue our beat. And we keep the bass line going. And let's have a listen to this. So you get the idea and we could we could loop that I might just put my drum beat back in there and play it from here So I've never had those samples before, but you can see that they all are designed to work with one another. So the loop library really is the gold dust in GarageBand. If you ever need a backing track, you don't need to um, get concerned about copyright if you use the loop library in GarageBand. You can use these samples copyright free uh, to produce your own music. So you don't have to play every single note. You can just uh, take advantage of what you've learned from music, what you've learned from a sequencer, to create a backing track and the one time where you might want to switch to time is now so if we switch from beats to time we can see how long that backing track is going to be and we can see that the at uh, the tempo that we we were using uh, and the measures that we've we've created if we switch to the time we can see we have 21 bars but that converts into 40 seconds okay so have fun create your own backing track using any combination uh, of as many tracks as you wish and whatever samples you wish and have fun with it. Give yourself about half an hour. Don't spend any longer than that because you could spend days on it. Uh, I just want you to see what you can make in half an hour. Okay? Okay, let's take a look at a couple of more little bits and pieces just before we finish up. Um, one of the things that you might want to do as part of mixing your tracks because uh, we didn't mix this track so let's let's have a go at mixing this track let's uh, bring all the levels back down to zero and we're not using this track so we can get rid of it delete track and what we're going to do is uh, introduce the levels good starting point is to get yourself a reference somewhere between minus three and minus six to start with so I'm going to play our drums at that level and then We'll introduce our bass. Okay, so we've got the bass right. Now we're going to bring in the piano. Although the piano's passed me by, so I'm going to stop that, bring it back. Just turn this down a little bit. And we'll bring it back to here and have a listen to the electric piano coming in. So 
So you adjust the levels until you get them the right mix of what you want. So I'm going to pull the bass back a bit. Okay, so I've got the, the various mixes done, but what this does is it gives you the levels for the track all the time. And sometimes you want the parts to be a bit louder and a little bit quieter, or you might want to fade in and fade out over time. So how do we do that? Well, in every other application, there is a thing called automation. Um, and we're going to show and hide the automation using this button here. It's at the top of the tracks list. So when we click this, our interface changes slightly. We're going to see yellow indicating things that we can automate. And we can show the automation lane with this additional button, Enable Automation. So what we're going to do here is we're going to automate. We'll start with the first instrument that comes in after the, the drums. We leave the drums nice and loud. And then we're going to introduce uh, an automation lane onto the um, electric piano. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So when I click on the uh, lane, we see this yellow line, and this is trying to control the volume. So what we can do is add handles by double-clicking, and this creates a dot, and this dot is referred to as a handle, and we can create multiple handles. So if I wanted to fade in, I might move the handle, then take the first handle and drop it down. So the height here, or the y-axis, represents the decibels, zero being maximum, minus infinity being silence. So let's just have a listen to that. We should hear the electric piano just fading, getting louder. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add automation to the end here. And we're going to fade out that loop. So now we've got our drums playing loud, we've got our bass playing loud, we fade in the electric piano and then we're fading out the EVP piano as well. Okay, so this enables us to control the levels, uh, changing the volume over time. And what you're actually doing is changing uh, the sliders. If you were um, changing the slider in real time, that's what you're doing by drawing these automation curves. Okay, we're just gonna take a look at a couple of miscellaneous things for editing. Uh, first of all, if you have a region, remember Alt, Drag, is for making a copy. Uh, be careful when you're alt-dragging though because if you alt-drag and you accidentally drop it, what it means is on the main timeline you've now ended up overwriting some information and it looks like you've lost it. Now this is a non-destructive editor so what that means is we can expand it back out so you can get that information back. Remember you can also use command Z to undo and you've got several levels of undo. Okay, uh, we might also want to pick out a section within a region. So if we move the playhead by clicking on the playhead or dragging that playhead to where you want to make a cut, we can then go edit and split regions, or if you like, command T, and what that will do is split the two regions. And then we can move a region away and uh, do whatever we want to do with that. For example, you might want to loop that by moving to the top corner. Okay, well, let's say we've got two different sections and we want to join them back up. Well, we can drag the two of them so that they're together. We need to multi-select. There are different ways of multi-selecting. You can do a marquee by dragging a rectangle and wherever it uh, overlaps, it's going to highlight those regions. Another way is to click a region and then shift click on all the other regions that you want to uh, select. 
Now, if you've got multiple regions selected, what you'll find then is you can do an edit and a join or a command J. And what this does is it puts the two regions back together. So you've seen how to use loops to create something very, very quickly, but we can use loops also um, with another feature that we learned in an earlier class uh, when we analyze songs to identify the intro, the verse, the chorus, maybe the middle eight or a bridge, and how we can combine those sections which are musically the same, how we can build up a song, a full song, really, really quickly. So to do that, we need to know about a thing called the arrangement track. So we go track, show arrangement track. This adds a special track at the top of GarageBand. It's got a plus sign next to it where we can add in new sections. So by default, it's going to give me an eight bar section. For this piece of music that I've created, the intro is just four bars. So I'm going to reduce it down to there. So this is telling me that uh, this is an intro and it lasts for four bars. And what this means is everything underneath that great bar is considered to be part of the intro. So I'm going to add another section. And the second section is going to be the verse. And in this case, my verse is actually 12 bars. Now, what's really handy is I can use what we've already learned about regions, alt dragging, will make a copy. So if I alt drag to the right, this is going to create a, a copy of everything that was in the verse. It's a little fiddly. Um, and it creates a copy of what was in the verse over here. So instead of having to copy each of the individual tracks separately, we can do everything in one go. So what we can do is build up the formula for the song after we focused on creating a verse, a chorus, an intro, and then we can use those sections to very quickly create the rest of the track. So now we've got a full piece. This has got an intro and two verses. the end of the first verse and now we go into the second verse and you get the idea